Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 155. So glad you could join me. Uh, today's guest is Katie Porter uh, in our makeup show from back when we had that fire. Remember, we had the fire right before a show one time in June, early June. Um, Katie Porter was the scheduled guest, and she is finally back. We had to postpone it up to August, which was the next uh, open date. So glad to have her. She'll be with us in just a little bit. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry. And I know you do too, so please do click the like button, share, make sure you're subscribed, leave reviews anywhere you're listening to this. You can do something to help poetry spread around the internet. Uh, now, as always, we're going to go first to our Poet Respond poet for this week. And we just had a wonderful poem about the very tragic uh, events that happened um, in New York earlier this week. Uh, Karen Kapoor is here. Um, hey, Karen, how are you doing today? It's very early where you are. Hey, Jim, I'm very well. Yeah, it ha- the day hasn't broken out yet, but I'm <laughs> here for you. So uh, so tell me about, I mean, everybody knows um, that Salman Rushdie was finally, um, you know, they finally attacked him, you know, after 30 years of um, having to be very careful and, and try to protect himself, um, you know, it finally happened. So how did you find out about that? And, and what can you say about it? What was your reaction? See, when I woke up, two different friends had texted me about about uh, the stabbing, and uh, it was not only was it tragic, but it was um, almost wonderful to see that so many people were already speaking about it because it seemed as if everybody felt a personal sort of loss, which was very interesting to see that how we connect with certain writers and how close we feel towards them, and something like this it just deeply saddened me. Like how how could like after you're attacking a 75 year old person, you know, so that was just insane. And again, then there's so much politics around that of, of freedom of speech, of religion and all of that. It's just, it's just too, too depressing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, for sure. Well, why don't you read your poem and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. Most certainly. Uh, so the poem is called Salman Bombay. I do think of Bombay as my hometown. The epigraph is by Salman Rushdie, and he loved the city. So I do think of Bombay as my hometown. Those are the streets I walked when I was learning to walk. And it's the place that my imagination has returned to more than anywhere else. I have spent almost a month in Bombay with Midnight's children on my book stack, taunting me. Each time I think, let me open the first page. I remember another place I have to be. You called it your love letter to India. Being from Delhi, I don't understand why anyone would write a letter to India. Sky, a tarpit of cancer, Yamuna more akin to a block of frozen sewage than waving black water. Each small street bloated with buildings and people like a starving child's belly, sick with koshi or kur. Bombay is more polluted than Delhi, but it boasts an ocean. Is Bombay rain different from Delhi rain? It is a question of lily or acid. The sun appears here like answered prayers, unpredictable, infrequent, and always more beautiful falling on your face through a veil than stitched on your skin. Outside my window, above your book, the clouds are compliant, smoothening through the gray blue sky like children off to school. Wind bulldozes through a banyan's dreadlocks, Isn't it funny how telling the truth often feels most like lying, like doing something wrong? Here is midnight and I am awake because in New York you have been stabbed beyond sharp how many times. I glance again outside the window and think of water, think of thirst, think of opening my mouth, think of moths, think how could anything as bird-like as music make one a criminal, a child. Blue beneath half a glow streetlight is trying to stretch a blanket over his body in the hopes that it might become fire, engulf his gold. His father snores nearby, no mother in sight. I refresh my screen, ghost a hand into the sticky air, feel pinpricks of light, salt, rain. Wonder, are you allowed back in India? Please come back with your eyes open. And that was Sunday's poem, uh, Salman Bombay by Karan Kapoor. 
Um, can, can you talk a little bit about just your your personal relationship with uh, Salman Rushdie's work? I mean, what what did he what did he mean to you? I mean, I, I think I've read two of his novels and uh, Howard and the Sea of Stories, which nobody talks much about. It's one of my favorite books. I love that metaphor for what creativity is, where he's pulling out the stories from the sea. Um, and like, yeah. you know, from the depths there, not knowing what lurks below, um, just a wonderful children's novel, I guess it is. Um, yeah. so, so uh, he what... wrote it for his son. He actually wrote it as a response to people, um, I don't know, so the, to the fatwa, like it was his act of resilience to write a children's story um, as a response to his uh, official death sentence. Um, I... I think Salman Rushdie is a giant in a giant of Indian literature, and he's probably the biggest guy around here. And though I've tried to read Midnight Children on multiple occasions, I've always felt as if I need to wait a little bit more. You know, sometimes with certain books, you have that. My relationship with him mostly was based out of watching his masterclass, which I did recently. Um, and I was so touched by the man himself. He was so grounded and like honest in, in his speech and in, in the way he spoke about his craft, despite his fame, his, his, the grandness of his, you know, like the nature of his work is itself very grand and huge, but he himself seemed like a man grounded so much in reality. And that was just um, very touching. And I, I, I think I feel very close to him. And especially now, I was moving around Flora Fountain. There's a place in Bombay called Flora Fountain where there are bookstalls. And I was there the next day because of, of the stabbing, like a few hours after. And I asked people, have they sold a lot of Rushdie today? And everybody said, yeah, why? Why? Because they weren't aware. And I was telling each bookstall person that this is why you have sold 13 copies of Midnight's Children today because the guy was stabbed and... Um, Again, it's tragic yeah. that we live in a world, despite all the modernity and everything, with so much hatred. Mm -hmm. It's true, and just and and you know, Rushdie signifies more than most people that that you know, words are the answer to violence and the antidote to violence. You know, it's just so important that we talk about things and and not resort to that. So, um, yeah, just tragic to hear. I, I don't know if you've seen updates. Um, the last I heard that he seemed like he was going to survive, oh, but but with yeah. serious, yeah. you know, physical problems, um, oh, losing an yeah. eye po possibly. Um, yeah. yeah, and a long, long road to journey, mm -hmm. uh, like long journey to the well-being. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thank God for that. Cause I think when he wrote the poem, we didn't even know. Right. So yeah. 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 So it's wonderful to hear that, that he'll, he's, he's going to come out of it, I think, and, and hopefully, and uh, yeah, so that's some good news in it. In fact, when the poem was written, the ending lines weren't referring to his probably losing, losing. And I, I did not know that when I wrote it. Oh, wow. It just, it just became like a beautiful coincidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the magic yeah. of poetry. Well, Karen, thanks so much for joining us. It's been great talking to you. I'm glad you could wake up early to uh, to catch the Rattlecast over there. It's like 5.30 where you are. Maybe uh, take a nap and then uh, start your day after that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Tim. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, always yeah. a pleasure. Thanks. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, and that was Karan Kapoor, um, Sunday's poet with uh, Salman Bombay. Um, we're going to take a quick break now, and we're going to go to today's main guest, Katie Porter. So uh, hold tight, and we will be right back.
And we're back. Thanks much for your patience. Um, as I mentioned, today's guest is Katie Porter. Katie is the author of 10 books and chapbooks, including her newest novel, which is right here, a chapbook from Bamboo Dart Press. Her work has appeared in, so to speak, a feminist journal of language and art as winner of their annual poetry competition, as well as many others, including Rattle, the uh, spring issue, I think it was. Uh, Verse Daily, Salon.com, Contrary, Shark Relief, Reef, a whole bunch of other places. She's also the founder of the poetry journal Poemelian, which we'll talk about, or Poemelian, I guess you'd say. I always trick, I always stumble on what to say, how to pronounce that, but it's Poemelian like chameleon, I believe. Um, and lives in inland uh, Southern California with her family, where she also directs the Inlandia Institute, a literary nonprofit. It's just so much wonderful stuff around here. Uh, so a lot to talk about today, as well as this great book. But here she is, Katie Porter. Hey, Katie, how you doing? Hey, Tim. I am doing very well. Um, another hot day in Southern California. Yeah, in but... fact, I have to warn everybody that I had to open my windows because last time I had a hot day, it's much ho- it's much hotter where you are than where I am. But still, the air conditioning doesn't reach this room. And last time, the um, my mouse USB overheated because it got so hot. So um, oh, nice. I have to leave the windows open. So if you hear ambient noise, that's what it is. Um, but it is great to see you, Katie, and so glad you could make it after the, uh, the postponed show. Yeah, well, that was really scary right up until the last second. We weren't sure if we'd have to postpone, but I'm just glad that you guys were safe and that, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, we have all these fires mm-hmm. and every year it's a challenge. Yeah, for sure. And the fire was out, but we had no power was the problem. I think power wasn't mm-hmm. restored for another, like five days or so. Um, but anyway, let's jump into this new book novel. What do you want to start with? Um, how about Folding Dave? Okay, that's a great one. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. So, Okay, Folding Dave. Today the filming begins, and I am anxious because Dave is anxious. He is drinking his hot tea through a straw. His tea is spiked with the tears of my grandmother, which I will use to starch his collarbone, his knees. The camera begins rolling, so it is now that I must explain again to Dave why we are doing this. That is for the children, for posterity, for generations to come, to see how it is done. I gesture toward the table, and Dave hops up onto the edge, knees buckled, dress shoes kicking the chilled air. It is best to fold when it is cold. I lift Dave's knees up and onto the exam table, lay him back, and while prone, I slip my hand beneath his buttocks, slide to mid-thigh, lift upward. His shoes flat toward the ceiling fan, legs stiff. I begin the first fold, legs to chest, one foot over each shoulder. I press everything into place. I smooth his thighs and the backs of his knees until they are flat. I begin the next fold. The cameraman zooms in. I fold Dave in half again. Dave's limbs yield. He's now compact enough to fit in a drawer, a wheeled suitcase, a shoulder holster at the ready to be brought out again when only a Dave will do. Everyone needs a Dave. That's great. Everyone needs a Dave. That was Folding Dave uh, from Katie Porter's book, Novel. Um, and this book, Katie, that's a great example of uh, how the poems operate in this book. They're sort of like fun, imaginative anecdotes or, or little vignettes and character sketches of different people that just spring from your imagination in a way that seems like you're just having fun with it. And so then we have fun with the book, too. Can you talk about how the book came to be? Why was it that you were uh, drawn to write a book like this? And, and what was the process like? Well, um, this book actually began just as a bunch of random poems written over a period of time. Um, at, during the first winter of the pandemic, when we had a lot of time on our hands because we didn't know what we were going to do next, um, I decided to go through my hard drive and see what poems I had that I you know, hadn't done anything with. And so I pulled everything together, stuck them all in one folder and started organizing. And that's, um, you know, I ended up dividing them into two groups. One, which is sort of these absurd, almost silly, but if you think a little harder about some of them, they're not, they're a little more serious than they might seem on the surface. Um, And then 
these other ones that are not in the book, but include poems like the one that was published in Rattle in the checkout line at Rite Aid. So those are more grounded in reality. And I um, just really thought that I wanted to um, get a book out. I loved Bamboo Dark Press and what they're doing. Um, their little chapbooks are really cute. And I've written about chapbooks for uh, my column for the Inlandia Literary Journeys, which you also write for, Tim. But I just, I love the chapbook as a form. And it's always, it's a good way to try and explore a certain either theme or style. And so I just tried to find a bunch of poems that seem to all relate to one another mm -hmm. in that way. Um, and I, I liked the idea of naming a book of poems novel because <laughs> it's just kind of counterintuitive and fun. It was. It was funny when you um, I asked if you wanted to be on. Um, you'd sent your, uh, you know, the the publisher an email and said, "Hey, can you send me novel?" And I was like, "Wait, wait, novel? No, we're poetry." And then I realized uh, that's what it is. I was wondering about that about the chapbook form because I love chapbooks too. Obviously, we have the Rattle Chapbook Prize, um, uh -huh. and this book is very close to full length. Um, you know, it's fifty. You know, including the the, the front matter and stuff, it's fifty two pages, I think. And, um, you know, that's very close to like what you can, what's considered like a short full length book of poetry. Were you tempted to extend it out at, at all to, to make it fit a full length form? Because uh, it seems like it might be tempting, but um, but I love the chapbook form. And so I love it's just such a breath of fresh air to read this. So so what was your was that the intention behind it? Well, the thing about the Bamboo Dart Press books is that they're square. So they're sort of a novel size. Mm -hmm. Um there really are only, I think, 24 poems in here. I'd have to go back and count. But if it weren't for the fact that they are, you know, broken up onto multiple pages, if it were more of a standard eight and a half by five and a half format, mm -hmm. then it would be chapbook size. You know, 24 pages is about what is standard for a chapbook. So mm -hmm. sure, um, I could have expanded it, but... I also, um, you know, you don't want to force it into a longer form if you don't have other poems that really fit that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very cool. Let's hear uh, another poem from the book. What do you want to read next? Okay. Um, well, how about let's read Because the Dead Cannot Tie Their Shoes. Um, so this actually, the chapbook initially started out with that as the title that was in my head for a long time because the dead cannot tie their shoes. Um, and then one day I, I realized I'd written this other poem called novel. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's actually a much better, <laughs> better um, title for the book. It more encapsulates what I'm getting at, but I still, I love this poem that's gone through a lot of different um, revisions. So this is because the dead cannot tie their shoes. They wear flip-flops, chanclas, zoris, thongs, whatever you've learned to call them. Knobby toes rise up on either side of the divide, invite in the stones. Rocky beaches, asphalt shrapnel, gutters of broken glass. The dead roam among us, restless, seeking blisters, huts, anything to make them feel again. The dead dream of suckling juicy lemons with an ulcerated tongue, drizzle alcohol in paper cuts, rub soap and sunscreen in their eyes. Ghostly dust bunnies nestle on the closet floor, listen as like new lace-ups lament with their brethren about their lot. Consider the difference between can't and won't. And that was because the dead cannot tie their shoes. Uh, great titles just throughout this book, a novel by Katie Porter. Um, can you talk about the way the poems came to be? Uh, because it is, it seems so much like you were having fun with these poems. And uh, does that, do you know that you're going to be doing that when you sit down to write it? Or is it just if the poem comes out in that way and you start having fun with it and, and being playful in that way that, that it came and ended up in this book, but, but you don't know which, where you're going when you start? 
Sure. Well, you know, I'm kind of a dork in that I love puns. And if I see something um, like signs or, you know, I tend to to read things very literally, um, like, I don't know, throw throw caution to the wind. How far can you throw it? <laughs> How heavy is it? You know, those are the kinds of things that pop into my head. Um, so like with the poem Disarming Sue, you know, I was thinking about the how how easy it is sometimes or how people will try to manipulate other people by disarming them or being, um, you know, just trying to uh, catch them off guard or what have you. But I thought about that um, literally, mm -hmm. if we could disarm someone by, you know, removing their arms in this very absurd way and thinking about like Barbie dolls, the way their arms would just kind of pop off. I don't know how many of you out there listening know about that, but. Well, I think everybody, um, uh, you know, everybody had yeah. Barbie dolls or had a friend with a sister who had Barbie dolls, has very yeah. experienced in blowing them apart. <laughs> So that's that's kind of the idea behind that is something will just strike me as funny mm -hmm. and I'll want to write about it or like Lazarus in the bookstore um that that one came about because I met a real Lazarus in a real bookstore um his name is Lazarus but obviously oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not uh anything else was um different but you know they just I don't know, random phrases will pop into my head and I'll riff on them and revise them until they seem to stick. Well, do you want to read that, Lazarus in the Bookstore? Sure. Um, pop over here. So, Lazarus in the Bookstore. Lazarus was alive and then he wasn't. A clutch of books fell from his arms as he folded. A crowd gathered, took out cell phones. No one believes anymore, he thinks, browsing the spirituals in which he is referred to as merely myth, not even historical. But real is a matter of faith, he thinks, as even he begins to wonder as no one gathers to wash his sandaled feet. At his command, Lazarus rolls over and the crowds disperse. Later, some may claim miracle, but in fact, no one took notice. Among the books purchased by him that day, How to Raise a Saint. Nearby in children's, an angelic toddler is raising hell. And that was Lazarus in the bookstore. Um, I can't help but think of Flint Ridge Bookstore, where we used to have our poetry readings down, not close to you, but... Uh, but down in in, the, in, in uh, Southern California, uh, the children's section there. That's good stuff from novel. Um, you know, Katie, I've known you for a long time, but I don't know how you came to be a poet. Like, what is it about, what is it that drew you to poetry? And, and when did you start? Was there some kind of impetus that, that made it happen? Yeah, um, absolutely. There actually was. Um, so I like to credit my the fact that I'm a poet today with California poets in the schools, mm. you know, two California poets in the schools, because when I was growing up, we lived in Bellflower and I was so that's a city in the Los Angeles area. And I was going to Mayfair High School, Mayfair Junior High. It was one of those schools that went, you know, had a middle school and a high school all rolled into one. And I, my mom was a factory um, worker. She assembled flashlights and before that she made locks and, you know, she's did a lot of things. We always had books in the house. Um, my stepdad was going to school, but he was also a line cook and my dad was in sales. We weren't um, necessarily a literary family unless you consider VC Andrews literary. Mm -hmm. um, those are what, what I had around the house. So when I was um, in middle school, eighth grade, I was, um, you know, we had a visit from California poets in the schools, Jack Grapes. Mm -hmm. And, 
yeah, Jack is still around making noise. And I, in fact, I haven't, um, I've never been able to thank him personally, but it was one of those moments where, um, you know, they came into the classroom and we did some writing prompts. And I remember uh, one of the other poets in the group, Dorian Peretz, there was a paper bag that had a bunch of um, objects in it. And we were to reach in and take the object out and then write about it. And then at the end of this um, series of workshops, we collected our poems and we, you know, used scissors and glue sticks and made chapbooks. And it was a, a major turning point for me. I didn't know what it meant to be a poet. And I didn't know um, that it was possible to be a poet, but I, I think I fell in love with words in that moment with the capacity for language and self-expression. And when I go back and I look at those poems, you know, I'm writing about uh, death <laughs> and, you know, the end of the world mm -hmm. and all these crazy things that 13 year olds, you think you know everything and that the world is, you know, that it, I was a very dark teenager, uh -huh. I guess, <laughs> but um it was important for me. So mm -hmm. that's, that was really the beginning. And yeah. I've been writing ever since. Yeah. It's just amazing how important those poets in the schools programs are. Um, I know you, you've probably, I'm sure you've taught some, you know, in the schools through Atlanta, at least if not California yeah. poets in the schools. And for me, it was uh, the same thing. I think in fourth grade, um, Kathy Wakefield, who's a poet in Rochester came into our class and it was just fun. You know, it was a day of fun. And then that seed is like planted in your head. And then when you have a poetry assignment, you think, oh, that was fun back in fourth grade when we did that that day. And then you have fun with that, you know, and, and it just becomes a thing. And it, I'm sure so many poets come out of those programs. Um, have you done a lot of that? Do you like working with kids? I love working with kids. And in fact, I love teenagers in particular. Mm -hmm. um, this past spring, I was able to go into a middle school and into the AVID program um, and working with kids who don't get a lot of opportunities like this. And this was through the Riverside Art Museum's Art to Go program. Um, and it was kind of a pilot. And I took in a copy of uh, King Lear mm -hmm. and it was just an old paperback and I held it up and I talked a little bit about Shakespeare and asked them uh, if anybody knew about Shakespeare. And then I did something shocking. I tore a page out of it <laughs> and then I passed it around and told everybody to tear pages out. And at first they were a little skeptical, but then they really got into it. Um, I had a harder time persuading the teachers to do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but one kid asked, can I take the cover? And I said, yeah, sure, take the cover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he seemed shocked that I said yes. Um, and then we did blackout poems. And then at the end, I, I didn't tell them what they were doing. At the end, I announced that they had just written poems. And we had a, a conversation about how they, you know, words, you know, this, these are just words. There's nothing really precious about them. Mm -hmm. They use them every day to talk to their friends. They text. They love music. We talked about, you know, rap and hip hop and music in general and lyrics and how there's a lot of overlap between that and writing and that it's all about creative expression. And and then I, I told them that they had just taken the work of an old dead white guy and torn it up and made it into their own. Mm -hmm. And they seem to really um, they like that. Yeah, that is that. When I did a, um, I did I've done poets in the schools, or actually with um, they call it some writers in the schools with Red Hand Press, and we did that uh -huh. with the Wizard of Oz, and they enjoyed tearing that up too. There's cool. uh, yeah, there's nothing. I don't know. There's something about going into the class. So I'm just trying to encourage people to try to do yeah. this. In California, they have this um, um, California Poets in the Schools program, where they'll like sort of teach you how to like like approach a school and sort of get you know ask for funding and things like that. And that's kind of how this that program works, I believe. Uh, but no matter where you are, teach you know schools love to have that kind of thing happen, and you can really make a difference with with people, and it's really easy and fun. So um, you know, so everybody listening should uh, should think about doing that. I mean, we you know we have Prisoner Express um, coming up as next week's episode, and that's an important thing too. But getting in the schools um, is is maybe even more important. That's just a wonderful thing that everybody can do. Um, 
Yeah. Um, do you want to do, let's do another poem because we were talking about okay. Sure. Um, so I suppose while we're talking for a second about um, my eighth grade self, what I realized, I never turned in my uh, literature textbook. <laughs> so I still have my eighth grade textbook. And one day I went through it and I thought, I'm going to look and see what poets are in here now that I'm an adult. And lo and behold, there was Richard Garcia, who um, he was one of my mentors at Antioch. And I've taken workshops with him through um, Tebbit Bach in Southern California. And, you know, so th this next poem, um, we're friends on Facebook. And this was like in the early part of, you know, Facebook. And I was trying to find him on there. And I noticed that there were two of him. And now I know, of course, that one is, you know, spam or, you know, hackers. But at the time I asked him, why are there two of you here? And he said, there are several of us authorized to be Richard Garcia in this quadrant. Um, so that inspired me to write this next poem, Richard Garcia's are everywhere. And I shared it with him. And he has a, a private um, group that he teaches through Facebook, I think. And he shared it with his group. And I was really worried that he would hate it, but I guess he didn't hate it. So this is Richard Garcia's are everywhere. At first there was some ambiguity. I could never be certain that it wasn't the same Richard Garcia I'd seen in multiple places the same day until once I saw two in one supermarket shopping separate aisles. Recently I spotted several in a used car lot vying to purchase a single Powell Plymouth Last week, a number of them went door to door in the neighborhood, peddling books by Neruda like evangelists. Yesterday, they marched from the Library of Congress to the library downtown, carrying signs and flags emblazoned with quatrains. CNN first reported sightings in cities across the state, then the continent, then the globe. Richard Garcia's were carrying torches all through the night, reciting poems as they marched. Richard Garcia's in South Carolina, Tennessee, Wisconsin, California, demanding the rights of poets everywhere. Give us poetry or give us death. Only then did everyone begin wondering, who is this Richard Garcia and why are there so many of him? Some wondered which is the real Richard Garcia, as if that mattered. If you listen, an eerie whooshing can be heard as El Zapato flies through flies toward the one true Richard Garcia, powering up his army of Richard Garcias, each but the original implanted with the device to thwart the inevitable shoe. <laughs> That's great. And it feels like a Richard Garcia poem too. Um, yeah. I don't know, was that intentional? Were you trying to sort of channel his voice a little bit? Maybe a little bit, not, not intentional, but there is a poem um, that where he is trying to avoid his, the shoe coming from his mother and no matter where it's like a heat seeking missile, no matter where he goes, the shoe will find him. Uh -huh. So that's kind of what, what inspired me there. Yeah. We have uh maybe I'll play it later, but one of my favorite poems ever published is his, the, a poem by Andy Rooney about, it's just a sort of rant about the paperclip, which I just, it cracks me up every time. I think maybe we'll play it later. I just put it up, but, uh, but yeah, wonderful local poet. Um, if you have any questions for, for Katie Porter, um, please leave them in the chat windows, either on Facebook or YouTube, and I will pass them along. Um, but Katie, what is it about, you do so much for, for literature and poetry, between Inlandia and, and Poemelian and your own work. Um, what is it about poetry that's so meaningful and makes it valuable? Like, what is it about poetry that, that you dedicate your life to it? Like, everything you do is poetry related, pretty much. Um, so, so what is it that, that has meaning there, you think? Um, I like wordplay. I like um, the economy of language with poetry. Um, I like the challenge of, you know, poems and form, too. I think that's fun to try and fit an idea into a predetermined little box, but and sometimes breaking the box. But, you know, I also, I've... I do write some essays, mm -hmm. so that's something I've I've done. Um, with me, though, my poetry, you know, I 
I started writing poetry when I was young, um, but I think I really, you know, hit the ball, hit the ground running after my kids were born. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, um, it was one of those things where it, I had the attention span and the time to write a poem. I couldn't write a novel or anything. Well, it's easier to, to peck out a poem with the child in your lap mm -hmm. than it is to, you know, write, write a novel. Um, so my life is very much a hodgepodge of all these different things, you know, in Landia and Poemelian and my kids who are both young adults now, but are still very much um, a part of my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of these poems were written um, on my phone, standing at the stove, making dinner or, you know, sitting in the car, waiting for somebody somewhere, one of my kids, or I think with poetry, it's just been easier to squeeze it in to within, you know, the brief minutes that I have of respite from these other things that I'm doing. Do you think as you have more time, as your kids sort of, you know, fly the nest or whatever, as it were, um, do you do you plan on doing more with prose and other, other genres, or do you think you'll stick with poetry? Um, it's funny. I, I have a book in progress that is prose. Mm -hmm. It's nonfiction. Um, but it does take a little bit of a different mindset to sit down and write nonfiction versus poetry. Um, I, I hope to be able to branch out more. I've written a few essays that I think are successful. Um, so maybe, but I, I do always come back to poetry. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's my first love. It's my, um, it's the thing that I turn to when I have something to say and I, I need to say it. Um, it's poetry that I turn to and it's poetry that I read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, me too, really. I always think about doing something different and I just, I just love poetry. <laughs> I love the, the, the density of it. You know, that's what I love about it is just, there's so much and you can read and reread. Um, whereas, yeah. you know, fiction, I, I, there's tons of books I'd love to experience again, but I don't want to take the time to read them again, <laughs> you know, but a yeah. poem you can read and, and just recite in your head. Um, but let's hear let's hear another poem, um, and I think we're going to move out of this book into a different book now. So, what uh, what would you like to read? Um, how about so um, the book right before novel was my book, The Body at a Loss, um, and that was written in a period where it was right after my mom had had breast cancer, and I, you know, helped her with that. Um, and my, one of my work colleagues, so I'm executive director of Inlandia, but the um, my the previous executive director, Inlandia's first um, founder, she also had breast cancer. And she and my mom shared, uh, she had, they had the same surgeon, they went to the same doctors, they went to the same Lebed class, and they ended up knowing each other. So um, I ended up writing a lot about both of them for this, this other book. And then my, Marion, my uh, former uh, colleague, she passed away from breast cancer and my mother did not. So there, and they were both about the same age. And my kids were teenagers. They're now um, young adults. So that was, um, you know, the impetus for writing that. And I also had, you know, almost immediately on the heels of that thyroid cancer and an autoimmune uh, disorder, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Um, and so I wrote a lot about my experiences with that. Mm -hmm. um, so this poem is, it's actually one of my favorites written about my oldest son. Um, and I do write a lot about my kids and hopefully they're not listening because I'm not sure how they'd feel about that. But, you know, it's my, my life and my story, too. So this, um, the setup for this is I was sitting at the dining table with my oldest son, Jacob, and we were working on some homework. And he had had to read um, an essay called On Tragedy and the Common Man. 
And so therefore I had to read it too. And then I had to explain it to him. And then I had to help him write an essay about having read the essay. So this is reading Miller's essay on tragedy and the common man with a teenage son, the, with my teenage son the night before reading the radiologist report. So that's the title. My teenage son struggles to interpret Miller's prose, which to me says nothing more than we're all in this together. The tragedy is not a state reserved for nobility, but instead can afflict us all. So when my son asks me to help with his essay, I happily oblige because how much longer do I have with him really? And when Miller cites the psychology of Oedipus and Orestes, I ask and am informed that my son neither wants to marry me nor to kill me. Instead, he just wants to finish the damn essay. So I struggle to translate Miller's turns of phrase into language my son can understand, mocking jays and the strategy of applying one's intellect to save one's skin, the drama of loss. When the structure of the essay requires him to choose sides, either with or against Miller, he opts to remain unconvinced, although I suspect that if I had done a better job, he would be more willing to risk being wrong. In the morning, I will pick up the radiologist's report, which will tell me at which particular crossroads I stand. But what good does it do us to fixate on endings when everything depends upon the liminal, the little deaths that happen each day while we wait to live? Yeah, excellent. That was uh, reading Miller's essay on tragedy and the common man with my teenage son the night before receiving the radiologist report. A great long title from uh, The Body at a Loss. Um, can you talk about your writing process? Um, you know, do you, um, do you journal a lot and turn those into poems? Do you sort of have an idea, a spark of something that wants to become a poem, and then you sit down to write a poem? Um, and, and how much revision goes into it? Uh, do you write every day? Like, what's your, what's your writing process like? Um, I'd like to say I write every day, but I don't. Um, I've described the writing process as lines will occur to me um, or titles or ideas or what have you um, all the time. And it's like this stream that's constantly flowing. And sometimes I can grab it and catch it and get it down on paper or actually not on paper because I don't journal and I can't read my own handwriting, <laughs> um, but I'll type it in somehow. And other times I just have to take a deep breath and let it go and it, it's gone and so be it. But this, you know, most of the time I'll get an idea and I will either take a note and then come back to it when I can, or I will sit down and, you know, write out a first draft right away. And then I do revise and I do revise again and again. And um, I don't know who said it, but I've quoted it often. So whoever you are, I'm sorry, I don't remember, but it's a draft until you're dead. <laughs> um, I will continue to revise. And that's just how it is. Yeah, that's a great quote. I don't think I've heard that before, but it's so true. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I was just talking about that with somebody the other day, but you know, and just last week we had um, a poem of mine that I workshopped and I realized halfway through doing the workshop as part of the critique of the week that it was already published in a completely, you know, form that I was saying I was not happy with. <laughs> um, but there's no reason you can't change poems and revise and, and you know, make them better over time. Um, Dick Westheimer had a question, now, kind of tying into the last poem. Um, he asked, uh, do you have any limits about what you will write about when it comes to including your children in your poems? Uh, people have a lot of different opinions about that, about, about including family members and friends. Um, what, what is your perspective on that? That's a really good and hard question. Um, first and foremost, I just write the poem because if it demands to be written, then it demands to be written. So then the question becomes whether or not I will publish the poem. And generally speaking, the answer is yes. Um, if, if the poem is in fact my story, okay. if it's part of my story, I'm not going to retell somebody else's story. Um, 
and that includes my kids, but it's hard, you know, and with, you know, parents, um, an example of this would be in my very first book from Maple Press way back in 2008, Seven Floors Up. I wrote a long poem in sections um, that dealt with something very personal about my mom. And in hindsight, I it was not my story and I should have asked her mm -hmm. and I didn't. And I, I really worried about how she might feel about it when she read it and ultimately you know, she did read it and she wasn't um, unhappy, except that I'd gotten some of the details wrong and <laughs> she wanted to correct me. But, you know, I got lucky. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's going to get that lucky. Some family will be very um, distraught, but you have to, um, for, for local people and even non-local people, um, I'll tell you, look out in the next two weeks for um, an article by Alison Jeffredo in the Inlandia Literary Journeys column, mm -hmm. because she writes about this very issue um, that we have our shared story, which is, you know, a story that maybe everybody has the, the facts we can all agree on. And then we have our story, which might have, you know, facts that are slightly different based on memory and or re-memory of different um, situations and events. And, you know, you are entitled to your story and to telling your story and telling it in whatever way feels true to you. Um, I just, you know, we caution against telling anybody else's story. It's a really interesting perspective um, that, that, you know, everybody has a story. Um, do you ever think or have you ever considered writing about, you know, some historical figure or anything like that where it's not where you're doing research to do it? Or do you think for you, do the poems always come out of like your own mind? And so it's always your story is that do you, you know, we just had um, Anna Evans had a book, um, a wonderful book, that Dark Waters book about um, the Titanic. And then it mm -hmm. shifted to her about her mother's death, uh, you know, but there are character sketches of people that she read about in that book. Um, and do, do you feel like, like that's something that you are free to do if you would like to, do you ever feel compelled to do that? Or do you just feel like sticking to your perspective? I think I would like to do that if it were a subject that grabbed me that I, I really wanted and felt compelled to write about. Um, I generally don't feel qualified to write those kinds of stories. Um, I'm not a historian. Um, I enjoy documentaries. I love learning. And that's something as I've gotten older, I've gotten a, a greater appreciation for history. But um, that's not necessarily my, my area of expertise. So it would depend on the subject. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very solid maybe. Yeah. Uh, well, let's hear another poem. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip forward. So I read that one that was about my um, older son. The poem that was in Rattle most recently, um, it involves my younger son. And as a parent, I've had to grapple a lot with um, the fact that my kids aren't kids anymore. And time changes. Your, our experience of time and our perspective of time changes as we get older, but I really, um, one of the things that I really appreciate poetry for, and that in my, some of my poems, not the ones in novel necessarily, because those are a different register, but poems in this new collection that are still looking for a home and other books like The Body of the Lost and Seven Force Up. They're like time capsules. Um, I reread older poems of mine to remember these, they're like snapshots mm -hmm. of a previous time in my life or in my children's lives. So in the checkout line at Rite Aid um, is sort of that kind of time capsule. So um, in the checkout line at Rite Aid, Walter the clerk asks, how are you doing? And I say peachy. And he says, you don't look fuzzy. And I say, I feel fuzzy. 
which explains all the Theraflu and Dayquil in my basket. Ah, so you have the uncommon cold. And I say, yes, indeed I do. I did too, he says. How long did it take you to shake it? I missed a week of work and I think he's been here forever since my oldest was a toddler, since the photo department mattered, since we used real film and those paper envelopes and the drop box and pushing the double stroller to Blockbuster afterwards and picking our weekend DVDs. The Matrix now a classic and Walter even then was bald. And now both of us have put on a few and I wonder about the girlfriend he once mentioned how her kid that was not his kid is doing. Wonder about the play structure he spoke of building and did he ever have kids of his own or is that girlfriend too in the past? I think this, but never ask, even as he rings us up, me and my youngest son, who at 17 now drives a 20 year old car that like us has seen better days, but mostly it's just cosmetic and heck, at least it still runs. A line is piled up behind us when Walter finally says, see you later. And I say, yeah, see you around. Yeah, that was in the checkout line at Rite Aid. Uh, that was the poem that was in the spring issue of Rattle. I remember what we loved about that poem was um, um, just how down to earth it was. You know, it wasn't a, a lofty thing. It was like something that happens every day and, and is just engaging about life that you're recording and sharing, which is um, just a wonderful thing that, that poetry can do that we kind of sometimes overlook as we wrestle with the big questions of life. Um, you mentioned that poem was from um, a man a manuscript, Small Mammals, um, that's um, mm -hmm. looking for a home. I think you said shopping around. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that? Because you've done, you know, 10 books and chat books, um, you know, so you've sort of, and, and you have your fingers on a whole bunch of different literary organizations and know a lot of people through all the stuff you do. How do you approach finding a publisher and deciding like who to publish it with? Um, you know, a lot of times the contests are the only way for a lot of people to get into a publisher. Do you have a way around that that you've like found over the years? Um, <laughs> do you have any secrets for people? Because a lot of people are just wondering how to publish books and they would like to. Um, well, there's really no secret to it. It's just hard work. It's persistence. It's don't let rejection get you down. Um, I... So the story of novel is actually the story of small mammals too, because when I, during that first winter of the pandemic, I literally put everything and the kitchen sink into the one manuscript. And I sent it to my publisher of The Body of the Lost, Cabin Carey Press. And they sent it back to me and said, ah, we don't think so. Hmm. Because, and they were right, because it was too much of everything. Um, and it really need to, needed to be rethought. I naively thought that, oh, well, they said yes last time. They'll say yes again. Well, you know, it's like, you know, everything resets. Once you publish somewhere, just because you published there before doesn't mean your chances are any better. Just because um, I might know you or they might know me, that doesn't guarantee anything. Mm -hmm. Um so I've just submitted it and I revise every time it comes back, I revise it again and it's much better than it was. Uh, and when it gets rejected from the 10 places it's at right now, I'll do it again. And uh, it's, um, so Seven Floors Up was really, you know, took, took place when my kids were young, but there were a lot of other things in there too. Um, it was more grounded in the real, um, as was the body of loss, mostly grounded in the real and the experience of, you know, going through surgery and, and health issues. Um, so small mammals is really about raising young men in today's world and all of the challenges. Um, there's a poem in there about a conversation that I had with some of these young men in my circle um, about the Rittenhouse verdict. Mm -hmm. There's their poems in there about teen suicide. There are poems in there about um, overdosing. There's, you know, one thing that's changed from the, you know, when my kids were little to now 
is watching all of their friends grow up. And the promise that you see in young children, um, you know, you can't necessarily channel all of that. The kids are going to make their own decisions about where they want to go in this life. And you might not agree with all of them. And they might make you sad, but those are the decisions that they make. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of a lot of poems like that in there. Uh, well, let's hear another one. Um, we have a few poems left that you had listed. Uh, what do you want to read next? Oh, sure. Um, how about, so it's called Small Mammals, um, in part because I contrast, you know, human, the human mammal and, you know, kids and teens with all of the sort of urban small mammals that I encounter in the, my daily life. Um, so I had this really odd experience of being out for a walk with my husband and we're walking and, and right in the middle of the road is this itty bitty mole, literally that just, and we don't see them around here. And why is this baby mole in the middle of the road? So um, this poem was written after that, the mole. I stop in the middle of the road. That I saw the young mole at all is miracle enough. Exposed, trundling clumsily towards safety, furry chocolate sausage with legs crossing this ocean of asphalt alone, snout to the ground, pressing forward at top speed, which is to say not very fast at all. In fact, every few inches he stumbles, does a barrel roll, rights himself, the road is no place for a mole, intractable, impossible to burrow. At this fate pace, he'll fall prey to a cornering car, looping hawk or loping cat. Tenderness traps me, drawn to become his unlikely ally. I redirect him with my sneaker, stand guard as a car rounds the bend. Now, up against the insurmountable curb, it would be easy to leave him, let what may be, be. But instead, I bend, clasp the velvet of his midsection, deposit him beneath shrubbery where instinct drives his little digger hands to turn earth, tunnel under, rump waggling until he vanishes, not so unlike watching my own son drive off alone for the first time, the distance lengthening forever between us. And that was uh, The Mole, again, a book poem from... Um... Katie's forthcoming collection, um, Small Mammals. Um, somebody asked, who was it? It was um, Martha Deed asked if you could say something about the future of plans for Palmelian. She says, I've been published there twice, but not recently. Um, and can you talk just a little bit about, about Palmelian? What was your intentions yeah. um, for starting it? Which is like, it must be 20 years ago or 15 or something. It's been uh, a while, right? Yeah, 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. I lose track now, but... Um, when I founded it, uh, my youngest son was only three years old, which means my oldest was only six. And I was still, you know, I was kind of new at publishing my own work. This is two years before my first book came out. And I was standing in the kitchen, probably with too much wine. And my husband and I were, were talking and I was griping about how long it takes for editors to get back to me on things and you know I hadn't edited anything at that point and he said well why don't you start your own journal and his idea was that I would do it and that I would that would give me a, a channel to publish my own work mm -hmm. but no way I I've never I don't publish myself that's just kind of how it is but um that was the impetus for it also it was um about two years, you know, two and a half years or so before I decided to get an MFA. And a uh, little known fact is I did not get a bachelor's. Um, I went to community college off and on, but I did not um, get a four-year degree. So I always felt like I wanted to go back and finish my education. Um, I joined the women's poetry listserv at the time, which was really a lifesaver when my kids were young. Um, and we were just, uh, you know, I was able to lean on them as a resource. 
And I think that's where Martha, uh, where she might have first found Palmelian. Um, but I use Palmelian as a, a learning tool for me. And I continue to do so. Every issue is on a new topic. We've done an ekphrastic issue of poems and form. We did a um, ultra talk issue, which or actually we called it the primetime poetry issue, Tom Hunley's idea. And it was great. You know, we did a lot of David Kirby and things. We've, um, done, we've done issues on um, speculative poem. We called it the uh, unreal. We've done an Asian American issue. Um, we did, you know, um, most recently visual poetry. So Palmelian is still here and we still, we, it lives on and it will continue to live on in one form or another. But the biggest challenge that I face is I'm now, unlike back then, you know, I thought I had my hands full just raising kids, mm -hmm. but you know, now I run a nonprofit in addition to that. And I have my own writing career and I've got my family. So time, mm -hmm. time is, is the biggest issue. So when the next issue of Palmelian will come out, I don't know um, what the next um, theme will be. I don't know. It'll, whatever strikes me <laughs> that I want to learn about next, who knows? But I learned a lot with the visual poetry issue and I learned about acemic poetry, poetry that just looks like scribbles, no semantic content, which was really new to me. Um, and poetry that looks like art. There are all different ways to write poems. That's that I think what I love most about poetry is that it is so varied that you know you can never run out of ways to make it new. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask was, um, you know, how you keep it fresh after all these years. So you kind of like, explain that. And, and then the burnout, too, I guess, that goes into, um, mm -hmm. you know, running something for so long. Um, do you, um, I don't know, what, what did you learn in the process, um, you know, about your own writing? Is there something that reading submissions has done to help you, you know, incorporate into your own writing? Is that part of your growth as a writer doing the editing? Um, I would say yes. Um, for one, the best and fastest way to grow as a writer is to read. And so when you are reading for a journal, you're reading um, tons of submissions, you get a good sense of the types of poems that are being written, you know, contemporary poems that are being written. Um, and if you are reading for a particular theme or, or concept or, or kind of, of poetry, it's, you know, you read so many and it becomes clear fairly, fairly quickly, um, which ones are good mm -hmm. and which ones are less good. Um, so that taught me a lot about how to look at my own writing and I'm pretty clear eyed, I think, um, just about what is good and I am easily, you know, I, I have no problem throwing away a poem or throwing away a false start for myself. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the past I might've forced it to work. Now I'll scrap the whole thing and start over. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Very interesting. Um, when you when you say it's very clear um, what poems are working and what aren't when you're reading, do you have any? I mean, that's my experience, too. It, it's just mm -hmm. as easy as I think like listening. I was compared to just like flipping through a dial on one of those old radios and you mm -hmm. just you hear music at a station, you know, <laughs> and then you're like, oh, there's a there's music. Um, what what is it that you think? What what is it that stands out to that? Do you and have any sort of access into what that magical mystery is of why something's working and why it's not? I think some of it comes down to that freshness of language. If, if I read a line and I even get a, a whiff of cliche, I want to, you know, set it aside. Mm -hmm. If there, if it's a phrase that I might've heard elsewhere before, unless it's being used in an ironic way or in a way that serves the poem, then, um, or if it's just too sentimental or, doesn't have the payoff at the end. Like 
sometimes you'll you'll read a couple stanzas of a poem and you think, oh, this is this is pretty good. But then, you know, it just ends mm -hmm. and there's no. It doesn't not that I think poems should wrap up neatly. I actually really like things that are ambiguous or, you know, can be interpreted many different ways. But if it just ends, then I think, you know, they're, they're, it's unfinished. Um, sometimes we writers, we rush to submit things because we feel like that's what we have to do, that we have to publish and we aren't a writer unless we publish. I think we need to take a little more time before we hit submit that it's not the volume and it's not how many places we've submitted to or how many poems we've submitted. It's the quality, not the quantity. Yeah, good point. And, uh, and definitely give those editors a break because <laughs> it's a lot to yeah. read. Um, so we've been looking at some of these uh, visual poems as you were talking, um, and it's it's poemillion.me, so it's okay. poem, E-L-E-O-N, dot M-E, if you want to find the website and look at some of these visual poems. Uh, Mark Grinier was asking if you do much visual poetry yourself. He noticed um, if you look, let me see, I'll put it on the screen. Mm -hmm. The um, Not for you, but for the guests, your cover on yeah. novel, it's the word novel written um, over into the form of a chick or a duck or something. Um, yeah. Is the cover. There are four shapes. There are four you, shapes in there. There's an apple, a bird, a duck, and a snail. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, that is very cool. So that is art by, I think it says somewhere. Dennis Kalachi. Mm -hmm. So Bamboo Dark Press is run by two um, artists. Mark Givens is a book publisher and musician and a writer. And he also runs Pelicanesis Press. And then uh, Dennis Kalachi is a musician and artist. And he runs Shrimper Records. And so together they've, um, you know, com they've combined forces to do these bamboo dark press books. And Dennis does almost all of the art for the covers. Mm -hmm. um, and we went back and forth on a lot of different things for the cover and that was his idea. No, I don't do any visual poetry myself. I have not yet done that. Um, once upon a time, I was an artist. I for a brief period before my oldest son was born, I did paint, but it's harder to clean up paint <laughs> yeah, for sure. and when you're chasing after a toddler than it is a poem. I can put the poem down. Um, and I, my sister is the artist, not me. My sister, Amy. Hi, Amy, if you're listening. Um, so no, but, and in fact, the cover art was really all Dennis's idea. Mm -hmm. Um but I, I said, yes, I love that idea. So so are you tempted now, though, after doing the Vispo issue? Because I find that, you know, we do an issue and you sort of explore what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And I just want to do that stuff. Like we do a haiku issue on a bunch of haiku or, uh, you know, I want to we're doing NFT poems coming up. I want to try making poems, NFTs. Um, so I want to, you know, it's you're just kind of I'm drawn to do, try the stuff that we're doing. Do you feel that way? I do. Well, in fact, so every issue of Poe Million has been, you know, I that's one of the guiding forces and how I decide what I want to do. It's a, a kind of poetry that I want to learn more about. And it's often one that I am currently obsessed with. Um, I am not necessarily currently obsessed with visual poetry in the same way that I was with, say, ekphrastic poetry or poems in form. But I would love to experiment with it. I think that um, I could see myself doing some collage. I definitely like collage as a medium, as an idea. Um, I can't draw to save my life, so I probably wouldn't do that. But the idea of a scenic poetry is really, um, it's intriguing. I mean, what makes that a poem and not just scribbles? Who who is that uh, the poet who did that? I was trying to find that poem, but I couldn't find it. Well, there are a lot. There are a whole bunch of different Asimic poets in in the issue, mm -hmm. um, and I can't give you a name off the top without going and looking at it. But let me. Um, oh. Jihan Asher Cook is this? Is it right here? The 
last it's yeah. uh yeah okay i think i might have found one here so this yes. is what what uh, katie's talking about and so it's um text you know it doesn't really say anything um but it's the text as a visual object is that what is going on here correct and you know i really um i can't talk about the visual poetry issue without thanking maureen alsop who is a longtime friend of mine. Once upon a time, she was in my writer's group and then she moved to Australia. But she is um, a fabulous poet in her in her own right, but she also has this love for visual poetry and she had been lobbying for years to do an issue of visual poetry. So I, I wanted to try it. Um, sometimes it's about getting outside of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And this was a, something that I had not ever um, experimented with or experienced. And reading and looking at the different, it did become clear, even with, with these visual poems, with Vizpo, the good ones versus the less good ones. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the less good ones look more like you know, stick figures, or there's no um, composition to them. There's no rhyme or reason to how they're laid out on the page. But with the really the good ones, the ones that struck me as both um, a good example of visual poetry and art, you know, they're pleasing to look at and say something about language. I mean, there is something the whole idea of acemic poetry, writing without semantic content, it does, it's meaningless. That is in itself a comment on language. Um, what is that saying about language's ability to convey meaning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, Jabberwocky, of course, is the example of that in a way. Um, and I should say that this too, um, this is Lost Pearls by Asher or Jihan Asher Cook. And in the Lost Pearls, um, every time there's a an L, an O, and an S, and a T, it, it spells out in large for the people who are listening. Um, so, so they're, they're words that sort of pull out of this text. It's a really interesting piece. Um, and there, I'm sure there's, and like you say, there's, there's other ones in there. I meant to ask, where did the name, uh, Paul Melian come from? Well, how did that, how'd you come up with that? Well, it was the idea of poem and chameleon, like mm -hmm. what you said in the beginning. The idea was that with each issue, it would change. And in the beginning there was, um, I changed the format of each issue to, you know, it was kind of fun. I was new at using um, Squarespace and I would change the template every time. But then that got really old because when you change a template, then it goes back. Um, it changes the formatting of all the previous poems that you mm. so painstakingly formatted. Yeah, that's why so, we don't change uh, rattles. <laughs> yeah, rattles template. I, I've learned. <laughs> Um, Anthony Santulli, if you want to look at that, that's an interesting one. If you're still looking um, at um, some of the... Yeah, sure. Let me go back. Or I'm trying to find one that I'm thinking of because... Um, oh, yeah. Here's this. Oh, this is interesting, too. It's sort of text written on top of each other. So it's illegible, but there's a poem in there. This is An Anthony uh, Santulli. Um, and some of the words you can see is the text sort of gets less on top of each other. So very interesting. And you can kind of imagine what it might be saying, even though it's illegible. Yeah, I think that's kind of, you know, an erasure is one kind of a visual poem, but um, they're all different ways to to do it. You can layer, you can um, do collage and then paint on top of it. You can, um, you know, do like what what he did with the typing over, you know, multiple layers of type. Um, or you can just do the, where you just put your hand down on the paper and you, in fact, maybe it's under the spotlights. Um, the Acemic Front, that's the name of the journal. If you, um, let's see if, oh, but I don't see it, okay. Well, I don't want to take too much time with that, but it was one of those um, 
it was just a major learning experience mm -hmm. for me. And it was a way, it was a growth um, experience because I, it was something I didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. And I, I do love learning. I love learning new things. Um, and I will continue, you know, Paul Million for as long as I uh, have the stamina mm -hmm. for it. Um, yeah. yeah and even if that means, you know, bringing on other editors, if I don't have the time to do it, um, which I don't really. So we may do another, you know, change and uh, completely change our skin again before we're done. Mm -hmm. Well, very cool. That's such a fun uh, website that everybody can explore and check out. There's um, how many issues? 20 or so? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So should you check that out? Uh, Palmelian.me. Uh, we're kind of out of time. Do you want to read one last poem? Uh, sure. Um, let me see. What have I not read? Um, you had so, the patient, um, if you want to do that one from... Um, sure. Patient survey. Yeah. Um, so this one was inspired on one of my many doctor's visits. Um, there was literally a stack of patient surveys on the end table in the doctor's office. And I wanted to kind of take it literally a very patient survey. So in the waiting room, a glowing fish tank emanates from a flat screen hung high above our heads. The goldfish flit, the bubbles gurgle and the pump swooshes pixelated water through a pixelated filter and back into the goldfish hush. On the walkway toward the wellness center's door, I take care to avoid crushing the snails. What separates them from us? How patiently they make their way from one piece of grass to another, dragging their glittering trains. I lift one, move it to the other side, but who am I to know where it was headed? Suppose I have just set it in a patch of salt, imminent death. What is it that plucks us from the rush, deposits us this side or that side? What care have they taken to avoid us smashing into the dust? On the end table, a stack of pamphlets, patient survey, how patient they are waiting. The stack found out as though many hands might reach for them at once. Yeah, excellent poem. That was um, Patient Survey, and that is from the book, a, what's the book called? Body at a Loss. A body at a Loss, that's right. Yeah. Um, Katie Porter, thanks so much for being a guest. It was just great poems and, and really fun discussion. I, I learned a lot, and I think everybody at home did too. I appreciate talking to you and all you do. Likewise. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, take care. That was Katie Porter. Today's guest, you can find more at katieporter.com. Uh, that's C A T I. Porter, P O R T E R dot com. Um, you can also find her book, Novel. Um, wonderful book here from um, um, Bamboo Dart Press. Um, and, and, you know, it's a chat book, so it's reasonably priced too. That's $7.99. Pick up a copy of that if you would. We're going to take a quick break and go to open lines. Um, so I'm going to um, grab the, if I can find, where is it? Let me see. I will grab the, the uh, link. There it is. I forget every time. Zoom is kind of new to me still. We'll copy the invite link. I'm going to deploy that into Facebook and Twitter. If you'd like to join us, um, Facebook and YouTube, I should say, if you'd like to join us um, and share a poem or maybe two, depending on how much time we have, um, find these links in the show notes and join into this Zoom. Um, you can share a prompt poem. The prompt for this week was to um, um, uh, write about a time you were a stranger in a strange land. Um, you can also share news poems about current events, something you published recently, anything you would like to share. Um, and and um, what else? Oh, yeah. And so make sure that you um, only come over to the Zoom if you would like to share a poem. If not, you can just sit tight right where you are and listen and read along with the poems on the screen. And email the poems, of course, to – that's the thing I was forgetting uh, – email the poems to – Open mic that uh, open mic at rattle.com. That's open m i c at rattle.com. So email your poems to me there that I can show them on screen as you go. I'm gonna take a quick break, deploy these links, and I will be right back in just a moment.
And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. Um, the prompt for this week, like I said, was right about a time you were a stranger in a strange land. Uh, and so here is my poem. This is a sonnet. And I thought I was trying to, to make it um, funny, but it might have just ended up sad. I don't know. This is Attending the Party. Um, I was thinking I could like send it to uh, Melissa Balmain at Light Quarterly or something because she likes formal light verse. And we always want more light verse, but I don't know. Maybe this isn't. We'll see. Here is my uh, poem for the week, Attending the Party. Uh, here we go. Attending the Party. You walked into the crowded conference hall as if it were a plastic bag of chips. You had to open slow but firm lest all that starch explode beneath your fingertips. The room was vast and full of noisy light. The people laughed. They clumped like tufts of grass in summer's breeze. Their cares, it seemed, were slight. They didn't notice as you scampered past in search of someone else as out of place. A waiter on a break, perhaps, but hell, a potted plant would do. Any space without an empty anecdote to tell could save you now from rushing out the door or crumbling to be vacuumed from the floor. So that is my poem for attending the party. And um, I got to confess, I, I was thinking about the AWP conferences, actually, um, but other parties, too, that I've had to go to, the, the few that I've been forced to uh, attend over the years in my life, business parties and holiday parties and whatnot, not the place for me. Um, let's go to the open lines now and see what we have. Um, and let's go first to, I think we did... Um, I think we did Dick Westheimer toward the end. Let's do Dick Westheimer toward the beginning this time. Hey, Dick, how are you doing today? Good. Um, uh, the interview was terrific. I really, really appreciated it. It, it was, it, I, I hesitate to say that it was heartening to hear that somebody as widely published as Katie gets rejections <laughs> from her publisher of her last book, but it, I don't know. I've had that happen with poems sent to some uh, prestigious <laughs> yeah. yeah, it happens. I mean, everybody, it's a blank slate every time. Uh, that's yeah. just the way it goes. And, you know, for Katie, it doesn't really matter who. Um, the only difference is if it's uh, if it's some famous poet we've published before, I try not to give him a form letter. So I, I kind of peek before I'm doing the form. Because I think once you send a form letter to, like, a poet laureate, they're never going to send it to you again. So, no. um, so I try to be a little more personal to people that we have a relationship with, if possible, you know, given the volume that we go through. Um, yeah. but, but what is it that, that you'd like to share today, Dick? Um, well, if I have room for one, I'll do Emmett's, Emmett Till's Accuser is Free. And yeah, there's you know, I think we might one. have, as long as they're not long, I think we have time for two. Okay, good. So uh, to give some uh, background on Emmett Till's accuser of, is free. Carolyn Bryant was the woman who accused him of uh, 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 whistling at her, touching her. Mm -hmm. um, and the um, a grand jury was convened again to try to um, uh, charge her with a crime for false, uh, um, making false statements. But there weren't any witnesses alive who could... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it, was, it it failed. So this is a poem remarking on uh, that case. And, and how old is she now? I mean, she must be. Uh, she's eighty eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Imagine just have... living like with that, knowing that you did that your whole life. I mean. Yeah, and I think she has some awareness of it, although um, it. I, I've read a lot of her statements in mm -hmm. preparation for this poem, and it doesn't really appear yeah. that she is contrite about it. Yeah, that's that's too bad. Maybe one of those things you have to bury it because you can't accept yourself otherwise or something. I don't know. And who knows? Yeah, could be. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and read it. after After the determination that Carolyn Bryant will never be charged, Emmett Till's accuser is free. She's got a husband who mounts her, humps like he's marching to Semper Fidelius in double time. It's always the same, quick to the parade ground, in and out before the tune is finished. So when she sees the beautiful boy, is he looking at her? She can't help herself, thinks 
I bet when he's a man, he'll do it on the backbeat all in rhythm with her, taking his time and hers, and a blush comes over her, and she looks away, ashamed, wanting some of that strange fruit, straightens her dress, collects the shred of her that's left standing. But she can't get that boy out of her. She's got to get that boy out. So she tells her husband, that's the boy who whistled at me. That's the boy who touched me. We need to teach him a lesson. That's the way it was. The boy leered at her. The boy touched her. The boy must pay. And it makes sense to her that all these years later, she's been acquitted of any crime. For who would not be touched by that boy's beauty? Yeah, powerful poem, Dick. That was Emma Till, Till's Accuser is Free. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, and yeah. what is the other one that you wanted to share? Uh, Schrodinger's America is seen from a distant galaxy. I am... <laughs> compelled to keep looking at these images from they're the just they're just amazing it's true yeah. and this particular one uh is not an amazing image because it's could be a photograph of something from about 200 million years after the big bang so it's just yeah so visually it's just sort of a red blob but um uh it is unclear it could be a closer a younger um, cloud of dust masquerading as as redshift seventeen mm. is is uh, interesting. What the, yeah, what the number is? So um, this is Schrodinger's America as seen from a distant galaxy, and Schrodinger, obviously being he of the cat in the box, uh, that you don't know what it is until you open the box. Inside the box, there's a galaxy which is neither distant or near, and the truth is so far away from being agreed upon, like it exists in two universes, one made of matter, the other made of it doesn't matter what the truth is, so long as I shout it loud enough that the galaxy, is it young or old, hears me, though if you scream in space, no one hears you, but I wonder if I scream super loud, if I could change the laws of physics, change your mind, because I'm right, you know, Trump is guilty, he stole shit, but you shout, he was framed, that everyone does it, and you shout so loud that one of your kind hears it, tries to take out the FBI with a nail gun, dies in a cornfield of shifting dreams and indifferent bullets, and now I don't know what to shout, back the blue, or defund the cosmologists because they are the ones who started it all with a big bang and some think that the galaxy is in a in the box was in the time and space where it happened cosmological moments after the beginning which some insist was 6026 years ago and some know was 13.78 plus or minus 0 0.020 billion but what does that even mean and some think that the galaxy in the box is just dust masquerading as an old one, playing galactic dress-ups, which is what we're all doing here, dressing in the clothes of it matters, or is it antimatter, which is what it feels like in Schrodinger's America, where what's in the box doesn't matter anymore, so long as it's different from what you think is in the box, which I hope I hope, I hope, is the collection of stars so fresh from the beginning of time that all of us just stop, lay back in the grass, gaze into the clear night sky, which e with each of our mouths open in taking the shape of awe. Yeah, another great poem. I, I just love, that's one of the things I've just loved in the last uh, few months, or month and a half maybe, is just these poems about space just make me, it's a, it's a nice breath of fresh air. Um, a lot of submissions about those. Uh, something sort of positive and dreamy to think about. Um, thanks for sharing one, Dick. Breath of fresh air in the vacuum of space. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, thanks okay. so much. Always good talking to you. Good talking to you. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. That was uh, Dick Westheimer with two poems. And yeah, like I said, if, you, if anybody has um, you know, two poems and they're not too long, feel free to share two or just one. And I'm going to go to... Um, Spartacus next because he's uh in Europe. I'm not sure where in Europe right now, but um 
we want to make sure he can go to bed because it's like 2 a.m. or something where he is. Hey, Spartacus, how are you doing? Hi, uh, I'm doing well, and you? Yeah, great to see you. It's been a while. Uh, how, what, what time is it where you are? Are you in the UK right now ha or are you somewhere else? I'm in Greece, Athens, and it's half past four in the morning. <laughs> Excellent. Half past four. So did you stay up late or did you get up early? Um, I did get up early. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I'm so glad you could join us. Uh, what do you have that you'd like to share? I've got a PR poem. Okay. And the topic for this poem is domestic violence and femicide in modern Greek society. And this is something that happened after the lockdowns. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is a, um, an issue that in the past was rare because nobody would speak up. But I think um, it's a real issue for uh, uh, Greek society now, especially with the huge rise in femicides in 2022. And the poem is called Apology of a Murdered Woman. Okay, have it go ahead. Yeah. Um, I could be a girl, a woman, or a wife. I could be young or old. I could be everything except from my oasis. I could live today, tomorrow, or next month. I never heard that you're sorry, except from the time you had to speak on TV. Public speaking is certainly not like my private thoughts. When a woman's love dies, she has to say sorry. Do you think that a woman must die together with her love? You know what? Death, not a good lover. Patriarchy goes everywhere. Death didn't even say sorry when I asked him for a hairbrush. He just showed me his empty hands, although I have given him everything. He didn't apologize when I was unable to travel. He told me, your journey ends here. He put me in a boat in a river without water. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty, climate change would say, I guess. Modern times, the ferryman told me. I don't even have to paddle, he added. During the spring, I waited for your flowers. During the summer, I waited for your warmth. You could have left a note or you could have sent a text to say that you didn't want the things I wanted. I now remember, you were never a good speaker. Each one of your words used to be another mosquito next to my ear. Oh, that was a great poem and wonderful ending there, especially. Thanks so much for sharing that, Spartacus. It's great to see you and, and glad you could share that and, and join us uh, the early this morning. Thank you. Yeah, bye thank bye. you. Goodbye. It was a Spartacus at Agnostorus with an apology of a murdered woman. And what a great image at the end. That was just good stuff. Um, let's go next to Karen Marker. Hello. Can hey, you... Karen. How are you doing? <laughs> it's so complicated with all these different <laughs> technologies. Well, you're I... handling it great. It's, it's <laughs> going really well. I'm learning. Um, <laughs> okay. So I, I am inspired by today's um, beautiful poetry from Katie and talking about being a parent mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, being a, and the prompt being a stranger in a strange land. I have a poem and also along with the space imagery that continues to work through me. I have a poem I'm going to share called Everywhere, Everything, In Spite of It All. Excellent. Fierce fighter with a heart that closed like a curled fist when you found yourself in a world that wanted to crack you in two, where you would rather take the fall, reaching after a rugby scrum towards a ball, would rather go out on a stretcher, every tendon sprained split, than go back where you came from, marred by those who would mark you a sex you never were. So many memories you carry, more than enough to break all the bones in your body. Why trust this world when the court is clearly stacked against you? But today is different. Look up, you'll see why NASA's scientists cry. Those specks their telescope shows 
billions of light years away are hundreds of billions of galaxies, a multitude of universes everywhere, the past, the future you have been waiting for. So you can loosen the weight and watch every cell of your clenched heart open all at once. Oh, another poem with a great ending. I love that. Everywhere, everything, in spite of it all. I love that turn toward the okay. two-thirds down. Thanks for sharing that, Karen. Sure. And then uh, the other poem was, um, okay. um, again, from both sides now, um, okay. after Joni Mitchell sings at the Newport yeah. Folk Festival, which um, I only know about this because we had a poem last week about it, oh. too. Oh, I missed. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so I was so moved and so surprisingly moved when people started posting it on Facebook. I just instantly started crying when I saw it on 725. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so this is um, again from both sides now. When she opens her mouth, it is like bird song flies out, full throated, prophetic. She sings the blue of beginnings. My first loves all the way back to the Cyclades, pure white marble goddesses carved from the clear Greek island waters. The flow of my fountain pen's ink, cave dwelling writings, a long slow birth, how the earth looks lit up at night, seen through frighteningly fragile blue, easily burst as a bubble. My house sails <clears throat> its farthest flight on this bed of song, then wakes on a street where her words fall like seeds among cracks in the courtyard. Red poppies bloom, bougainvillea branches scatter magenta petals. By the window, a wicker rocking chair, a flag unfurls, sweet milk flows for my daughter. No stripes or stars. Yesterday, when I left my back door open, a bird flew in. Wings flapped frantic at the glass, almost broke. After it found its way out, it would need healing. She knew, we all do. Find our strength in the blue that is blood. Soar the wide sky towards the sound of the sea. Today, another belly's full as the sun about to blossom all over this round world. Yeah, another excellent poem, again, from both sides now. And the thing I didn't know was, it, was that she had to learn music from scratch. That was the detail. I saw it, you know, posted all over and people being so moved by it. And it just, I didn't know that detail until uh, I think it was, I think it might have been Richard Westheimer's uh, poem about it that, that told me, but um, they clued me in on what was really going on. Um, thanks for sharing that, Karen. Two, two excellent poems. Okay, and now let's go to Carolyn Codd. Hello. Hi, Carolyn. How are you doing tonight? Oh, pretty well. Um, I, this afternoon, I learned of the death of a very good friend of mine. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. She's been my friend for 50 years, and hmm. I just learned of her death now. So anyhow, yeah. um, I'm actually going to dedicate my poem to her because she liked my poetry. And well, she would like that. So yeah, well, that's wonderful. I'm so sorry to hear that news. Um, anyways, this is from this is a prompt from the Stranger in a Strange Land, mm -hmm. poem. and it reminded me of a poem I wrote some ways back about some of my travels. But it's a kind of long, um, so this is two excerpts from that I kind of revised to go with this prompt. So it's called Israeli Itinerary. This is part one. One day I went all the way to Jerusalem where I had never been before to see someone, a stranger in an office there. Climbing many steps and thinking what to say before speaking, someone spoke to me. You must be Carolyn Codd. How wonderful, I thought, how odd. And part two, a lot on a hot night, seafront bar. Some young Israeli guys got in a fight, much yelling, much commotion, Use of fists and jagged glass of broken bottles, not much light. My friend Doreen and I were there. What fright. We climbed a wall, I don't know how, and jumped to safety in the sand. That's all. Yeah, excellent poem. Israel, Israeli itinerary. Thanks so much for sharing that, that poem and that memory, Carolyn. And I'm so sorry to hear about the loss of your friend, too. Thank you. 
Yeah, take care. Great talking to you. Too. Yeah. There's Carolyn Cod. And let's go next to Zachary Honeycutt. Hey, Zachary, are you there? Hey, can you see me? Uh, you're about to pop in, I think. Do let's I hit see. share screen? Um, I don't see it yet. Let's see. Where are I don't you? Why? I'm trying. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, I see. I could do that. I guess. What did you want to share? Can I? Can I come in? Can I? Can you see me? How let do me, I? Let me let you share the screen. Okay. Now, now see. Let's see if you can do that now. Can you see me? I can't see you. I just hear you. <laughs> Out yeah. here, I see. Let's see. I see your name now. I don't know what's. Uh... Okay, well, I'll just read. I don't know why. I, I don't know why I gotta. I I was able to see you guys last time. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. We hear you great though. So, uh, what do you want to share? Okay, so I'm going to do something a little bit different than my norm, and I'm going to share two awesome free verse poems today that I've always wanted to share on the show, but just for whatever reason was unable to. Excellent. So I think this is yeah, this is the first time. Uh... I've heard a free verse Zachary Honeycutt poem. Let's hear it. This is my blue is the first one. Is there anything you want to say about it before you read? Yeah, this one, I actually, believe it or not, got the idea from The Dark Knight. I submitted it to the Rattle Poetry Competition last year, and um, I like the fact that there's like a very blue tone in that movie, mm. and it just made me think about the color blue and all of the different images that the color blue could convey and I could conjure in my mind. And so I just started thinking of every metaphor that I could for blue. And so this is my interpretation of what the color blue means to me. Interesting. Yeah, go ahead. My blue. Blue is the tone of conversation when its chatter forms a melting pot. Whispers mixing with bolder voices like the sparkle of sapphire in the eye distorts cogent perception. Blue's tone is soft without any edges, its nature indistinct. It's dimmer and calmer than the blue in raging seas. The distance of blue is far out of time's reach it hovers in space where day's lives differ from those of the humble planet of blue. Blue does not play flashy games like red pines for a look from gazes of others. Their pupils jump to red while blue could hardly give a damn. Blue is the observer on the sidewalk of misanthropic stances, unable to rush through this test like the blue sea splashes the stillness from your eyes. Can't say if blue preoccupies its heart with thoughts, yet the heart of blue's beats is more in rhythm with that of a mature being. Blue must be more refined without making an announcement out of it like that demon narcissist red. Blue is a face that gets lost within clusters, as brief as a breath. A breath is blue, a wisp of the nonchalant preamble in the constitution of my disposition. My blue fish swims across time at a child's pace. My blue, unconcerned with the trends or profound details of what's going on around it. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks so much for sharing that, Zach. That was my yeah. blue. And you can hear the cadence of uh, the formal poet in there, even though even in free verse, which is uh, always interesting to hear. And uh, this other one's on one side of my mother. Is there anything you want to say about yeah. this one? Yeah, this one, I don't even know <laughs> what I even thought of to come up with this one. It's kind of like a Beatles song. The words all fit together and they sound good, but I don't think that there's an exact meaning for, you know, like what's behind them. It's it's left up to interpretation. It, it kind of has a dark ominousness to it by the end of the poem. It almost feels like something something creepy is going on or something like dark is going on, but you don't know really why. And uh, anyway, I just like the way it sounds. It's got a lot of rhythm, even though it's a free verse poem. Yeah, very cool. Well, listen and try to uh, extract yeah. some meaning out of it. <laughs> On one side of my mother, the scent of coffee beans and other wafting smells rise along with the sun up over the oven. It started there and went throughout like a child's topography. She waits there for my mother. She waits after coming in. She waits as mom sips coffee and when it burns a grin. 
She is green with envy for the death of mother's caring and the depth at which she does not care to make a statement in the wee hours, but rather to just blend in. Like the scents that melt together in the pot upon the oven. The neighbor, green with envy, walks away to start her day. My mother lets the pot's steam build and bubble as she sits and takes a breath. A yeah, very interesting poem. Thanks for sharing that, Zach. It was uh, definitely definitely something there. I, I enjoy it. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> yeah, you too, Tim. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Take care, Zach. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. And now let's go to Carla Schwartz next. Those were awesome. Thank you. You like them? Hello. Hello. Hey, Carla. How are you doing? Uh, we met. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, we got rid of the heat up here. Oh, uh, lucky. It came back to us a little bit. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful here. So um, I have two poems. And the first one that I sent you earlier um, is called um, Comment se faire? And it is prompt poem. Mm hmm. And uh, it has some French in it. Comment se faire is, you could say, how, how it's done. And it has the term moulet frites, which is uh, uh, mussels and fries in, in Belgium. Uh, Comment faire l'amour avec un nègre sans fatigue is the name of a film, Canadian film, and uh, which translates as how to make love with the Negroes without getting tired. And there is a small reference to um, uh, La Petite Mort mm -hmm. at the end. Okay. Okay. Comment se faire? Convenient for moules frites and a short walk to the train afterward, the theater was near the Grand Place. Ornate but worn, the cinema had molded balconies, velvet curtains, and, red, and a red carpet. Ushers and restroom attendants expected tips. My first day in Brussels, I held my bags tight. I took a place in the middle of the middle, an empty row where I spread my bags on a seat to my right. Comment faire l'amour avec un nègre sans se fatiguer, a Canadian film sparsely attended, the unemployed, the retired, and me. I was focused on the language, the Francais du Québec, and the Montreal neighborhoods I'd missed, Carré Saint-Louis, Rue Saint-Denis. When, when with all the empty rows in the room, a man sat down two seats to my right. Bristling, I swung my belongings to my left. Then another man moved in to sit down next to my bags on that side. Sandwiched between the two, I jumped the bags between my legs. Then man number one moved to the seat next to mine while number two closed in on my left. Not knowing how to behave in Bruxelles, I stayed put. When all my roommate, when my roommates began to pant and rub and I tensed my grip on my camera, my purse, I forget the end there, sorry. I craned my neck to watch the film like a stargazer. The men left before intermission, but I remained fixed until the end when I stood and stepped away from some small death. Yeah, powerful memory there in that poem. And I love the French. I'm so jealous that <laughs> that you can speak the French like that. Oh, thank you. And that that actually appeared in my one of my books, which is called Intimacy with the Wind. Mm, intimacy and, with the Wind. Yeah. And this book, this one is a poem called Contemplating Humanity While Swimming. And it is in my new little chapbook called uh, Signs of Marriage. Excellent. Um, and here it goes. After a mile, I stop paddling and drift. I strap an orange <laughs> swim buoy around my waist and then don the goggles, gloves, fins. Like a mink on a rock, I slip off my board. I begin arm over arm on my back 
towing the board behind me. The wind tickles the water's surface. In the cool air, I can't help wonder if there is snow on top of Mount Washington. Alan's admonishment gnaws at me. You can't write a poem that considers the humanity of a terrorist, a poem that prays for a sinner, like what Taha does in Revenge. I think about Tsarnaev as a teen, said to have been gregarious, friendly, funny. He probably watched cartoons as a boy. Then as a young man, his brother whispered, bomb. In, the, in cartoons, an explosion singes a finger, a wall crumbles, but the hero walks away unscathed. To calm my stitch, I take deep breaths. I'm on a beautiful lake surrounded by mountains. I flip over and swim crawl. I want to better understand lapses in judgment, including my own. I think about what it means to be human. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Carla. That was uh, contemplating humanity while swimming. And um, yeah, yeah, great, great, great poem pulling back to that. Uh, that tragic event, which happened somewhere near you, right? I mean, yes, were, in yeah. Boston mm -hmm. in 2013. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, take care, and uh, thanks for sharing that. that oh, thank poem, you Carla. so much. Take care. Yeah, always a pleasure. Yeah. Um, let's go next to uh, Mark Grinier. Hey, Hi, Mark. Tim. Yeah, how you doing? Pretty good. Um. This is a poem to the to the stranger in a strange land prompt, mm -hmm. and it's about uh, my father was an officer in the air force, and we were stationed in Libya when I was in elementary school, and this oh, is really? what it's about. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, interesting. It's called an American Child in Libya. We tried to take America with us when, in 1956, we moved to Tripoli, Libya, in the first years of the Cold War. My father rented the ground floor of an Italian villa underneath a Shaikam family who lived upstairs above us at the time. They had nice kids, and I, almost 11, was half in love with their oldest girl. Looking back, I see how odd this was so soon after World War II for the oldest son of an American intelligence officer. We were strangers in a strange land, well-fed and clean, among hundreds of Libyan children living poor and dirty and sometimes hungry in homemade palm frond and tin can huts on every vacant bullet pocked lot. Two families lived across the street from us. They got water from a metal piped faucet sticking out of the mud on the corner of our dirt paved street. These dirty children dancing danced in the street for us during Ramadan. They were tied into costumes made from palm fronds and string, and they danced in the dusty street to the sound of chants and bells provided by the local ad adults. Each small group gathered to walk the streets and beg for the bakshish we tossed from behind our bullet-scarred walls. They earned a few piastres for each shuffle dance they did in the Sahara heat. It never occurred to me that these Ramadan dances were the equivalent of our going trick or treat on Halloween evenings back home in the USA. Nor did I think when one family living in a lot across the street butchered a lamb and hung its entrails out to dry, that they were preparing a feast, a feast like the Thanksgiving feast my family held each fall to remember the welcoming feast prepared by tribes near extinction now in the homelands we now call ours. Yeah, very, very interesting poem and fascinating memory. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mark. Uh, that was mm -hmm. an American child in Libya. Uh, looking back, thanks. Um, and I have another one, if a smaller one, if you if you've got time. Yeah, sure. Did you email it to me? I only saw one. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't email to you. I didn't. <laughs> okay. Well, just we'll just listen then. Go ahead. It's called "Escaping the Light." I step out into the cool September night, leaving the light of my safe, my modern tract house home. I quietly walk across this porch, escape to the edge of darkness where, 
listening to dusk descending on the fringe of the forest brush, I smell smoke tonight. I hear the rustle behind block walls of creatures and leaves escaping this place, or maybe just searching for a bite to eat. I remember the fire a few years gone, burning these hills all week. I fear this darkness turning to heat and filled with flickering light. I am terrified tonight of darkness calling out to me some dreaded, dreadful bright delight. Yeah, excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mark. And, and what was that called again? That was called Escaping the Light. Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing that. Always a pleasure talking to you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Bye. Take care. So Mark Grinier with uh, two poems. And let's go to um, Jennifer Elise Wang. Hey. Hey, Jennifer. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. So, so what do you have for us? Uh, I've got two poems. So the first one is a prompt poem, and it's actually an old tanka I wrote oh. when I was in Japan. And I think I was feeling particularly homesick <laughs> looking back on it. That's perfect. How um, long did you uh, live in Japan? I just lived there for a year. It was mm -hmm. right after I graduated college and I went to go teach English. And I was actually kind of familiar with the uh, city I was in, but mm -hmm. just, yeah, you know, homesickness hits. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it seems wonderful, but, uh, but yeah, you would get homesick being that far away. Yeah, so uh, the Tonka goes, in a foreign land, nothing is more frightening than losing yourself in a crowd that can't hear you and knowing you are alone. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that captures it. Yeah. And then my other one, kind of sticking with the Japan theme, I really wanted to try the word cloud tritina. Uh -huh. And um, and I also uh, kind of missed the deadline for the poet's response. So this is kind of a, a belated poet's response uh, in response to the Japanese fashion designer, Issey Miyake, mm. uh, passing away recently. Mm -hmm. So, And I thought because he's such a creative person that the word cloud might generate something interesting. So uh, I skipped the first word, which was his last name and picked the second, third and fourth most <laughs> common words. Yeah. Sounds so, perfect. Um, yeah. It was one of those where I wouldn't, I didn't hear about that except for, I think two people maybe wrote poems about, about it. So yeah. Uh, the title is from an unlikely fashionista in Dallas. I began a student of Japanese street fashion, but eventually came across the names like, Reiko, Yoji, and Issei, innovators who brought their designs to the runways of Paris. Although Miyake learned his craft in Paris, he returned to Tokyo to meld form and fashion. It's no wonder Steve would collaborate with Issei. Although he's gone, the scent of Laodesi will take me to Tokyo and Paris, and I'll see how a piece of cloth can become fashion. I may never own a piece of high fashion by Issei Miyake, but I'll bring the flair of Paris and Tokyo to Texas. Uh, that was great, and yeah, I do love that tritina form. It's a lot of fun. I like it better than the tritina or the sestina. I have to say, yeah. yeah, it doesn't have to go on as long as the sestina does. It's a nice, tight little form. I like it. Thanks for sharing that, Jennifer. All right, thank you. Yep, yep, always a pleasure. Take care. All right. Okay, and let's go to uh, Guy Chambers. Hi, Kim. Hey, Guy. How you doing tonight? Good to see you. Yeah, I've got a prop poem here. And uh, like I said, like, I just got home late from the lake today there. So I had to, I'm on the way to something different. I was going to send it on, but so I wrote this one pretty late in the day here. So I sent it in there and see how it goes here. Very cool. Go ahead. It's called, okay, it's called Strange Land. Remote stranger walking on the edge as an intruder away from one's, oneself, miles away with a name and a back pocket, a breast time, untraveled, unheard, unseen, estranged to the virgin soil, off a beaten path, tender foot in the footsteps, full of curiosity and jittery, from out of the blue, unfamiliar words coming out of nowhere, many no unknown voices. Who is speaking them? Can't see nobody. Such so much magical words I never heard before. They open my eyes. Silent as I can be. I put my name out there. Don't know what to expect. Or 
Will it be will it be an outcast? I wait on t- tiptoes, sitting on pins and needles. The phone rings. I pick up the phone. Then a voice speaks my name. And then sp- sp- a voice speaks again. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm from Rattlecast. Do you want to read a poem tonight in the open mic tonight? Relief comes over me. Yes, I do. <laughs> I just look back at the first time I ever did uh, join the uh, uh-huh. Rattlecast. Really. So I came up with that. <laughs> yeah, very cool. I really appreciate that. That brought a smile to my face. Thanks so much for yeah. sharing that, Guy. Fun okay, moment. Thank you. The lake sounds like a great place to spend a day in, uh, in yeah. August. Yeah, usually I do that. Like almost all summer, I go out there and I stay for a week or two, and I do a lot of writing. Ah, that's so wonderful. Yeah. And, yeah, and a few beers <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And then I then I then, then come back for a little while, pay the bills, and then go back again. <laughs> not, okay, not bad at all. Thanks, guy. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Welcome. Yep. Bye. All right, and here's uh, Brent Stauffer. Hey, Jim. Hey, Brent. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great, and and. Uh, I, I completely agree with Guy. Uh-huh. That's a, <laughs> they're waiting on that call, and then you, uh, I remember when it used to be a, a Skype call. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then the thing would just blast <laughs> you with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because because there was a time lag, so you never knew uh-huh. when it was going to be interrupted by the phone ringing, and you're yeah. like, oh, it's. And then it's it's just him, and he wants to know if you want to share a poem, <laughs> and you do. So do you, do you miss it, or do you like uh, Zoom better? Now, I like Zoom better because um, <clears throat> there's not the time lag. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's the main thing. Yeah, is is, uh, is you you've you've uh, you're not as unprepared when mm-hmm. the, when the phone. Yeah, it's perfect. So, Although, yeah, yeah, catching you off guard, sometimes interesting things can happen. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think I have less technical difficulties with this. Format, yeah, so. for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I did a prompt phone. And um, once again, I found myself pretty grateful for the prompt Mm -hmm. because it encouraged me to uh, revisit uh, an experience I had a long time ago that was actually kind of pivotal, but I'd never written about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm thinking in terms of being a strange land, a a, a psych unit in a hospital Mm -hmm. is... Is you don't get much stranger. No, than, for than sure. I, I've worked there, so I, I can attest. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's and it's uh, just uh, bristling with poetic possibilities. I mm-hmm. think so. So that's what I wrote about. Okay. You ready? Yep. Go ahead. Of course you. Okay. Uh, psych unit, East Ward, day one. First, they take your belt and shoelaces. Frankly, I was glad to see them go. The fluttering fluorescent bulbs drain everyone of their blood the same way Derrida drained words of their meaning. I'm not the only teenager here. In fact, my roommate is 19, just like me. He paces at the foot of his bed, murmuring over and over, I am Reuben Douglas Jones. I am Reuben Douglas Jones. Day two. Occasionally, long white coats with doctors inside them float through the corridors. The nurses are walking gardens. Day three. Turns out I'm terrible at volleyball. The West Ward beat the pants off us. Thank God no one was keeping score. Day four. This afternoon, I auditioned for a faceless panel of eyeglasses arrayed behind a giant folding table. I presented my complaints in a heap, a trembling conglomeration of troubles. They'd seen it all before. Still, I got the part. Days five, six, and seven. Oh, medicinal mist. Oh, blinding fog. I'm a lotus eater now. My brain, suspended in a dark soup, hums to itself a tune I can't hear. Day eight. I'm cured, I joked with Reuben over some mashed potatoes. We both found this hilarious. In any case, I am walking home now, up the very steep part of 20th Street, with the summer sun lambasting me. Oh, his incessant stinging criticisms. 
I'm coming up on the entrance to Rue Burrow's Pub and Grill, where a man is trying to open the door for a woman in a wheelchair, only she's sliding backwards. Her wheel's about to fall off the brick landing, so I rush up and grab the handles of her chair as she cries out, and I feel the full weight of her in my hands, shoulders, and arms, which have suddenly become unbreakable rods of steel as the man spins around, his eyes blazing with fear. I've got her, I say. There's no need to tell him. I can stand like this a thousand, thousand years. Another great poem and a great ending. Thanks so much for sharing that, Brent. And a great take us on that journey back in time to a stranger in a strange land. It's been fun to hear different people's, uh, where they've been in the world. Yeah, absolutely. You're a great prompt. Yeah. Really fun. Yeah, very cool. Well, it's a pleasure as always. Uh, thanks for talking to me and sharing that, Brent. Absolutely. Thanks again, Tim. Yep. Take care. See you next time. Yeah, it was Brent Stauffer with us, Psych Unit East Ward. I'm going to shut down Zoom, and we're going to go to, we got a few more poems I wanted to share from people who couldn't uh, join us in person. And uh, one of, of course, is Nivedita Karthik. We're going to pull, I have to download her video, which takes a little while. So let me do a different poem in the meantime while that's downloading. Uh, here we go with that. Let's go, uh, for now, let's go to Kimberly McNeil's poem. Um, and this is um, the wrong pandemic. This is a oh we've already read the wrong pandemic, so let's not do that one. Um, but congratulations to um, Kimberly because she read this on the uh, Rattlecast um, maybe a month ago, and now it is published. It was on allpoetry.com. So um, yeah. Now let's go instead, let's do Sharon Ferrante's poem while we wait for this download. Sharon Ferrante has um, this uh, short poem, I'm Walking with a Tumbleweed. Um, and this is a time you were a stranger in a strange land, Cherita. So here's uh, Sharon Ferrante's poem. Let's see this. Walking with a tumbleweed, the ghost of a cowboy tips his hat to a stranger, chewing on the dust that chokes the wind. Very cool. Uh, thanks for sharing that poem. Um, that was uh, Sharon Fronte with the prompt poem this week. And um, let's go now to uh, Ted Guevara. And Ted likes to include uh, these photos. And there's a fascinating one here. Um, this is a photo of Elvis Presley, for those just listening. Elvis Presley um, in a painting, kind of like Napoleon Bonaparte or something, with a bunch of military pins on his chest. I'm not sure. Maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's not French, maybe it's um, American Revolution, I don't know. I don't recognize the medals, but um, you know, Elvis Presley as some kind of military general and next to the painting is an alarm clock for some reason. So this is a very interesting painting. Don't know where uh, don't know where Ted got this from. Actually, maybe let me see if he said so. There's been a trend on Elvis lately because of the blockbuster movie. Oh, that's right. We had a poem about that movie a couple weeks ago. In this poem, I take lines from his hit song, Suspicious Mind, and all this week I'm a little consumed by the affair of French Emperor Napoleon and his lady Josephine in the 18th century. I threw all of them together and came up with this poem. So I guess it was Napoleon he's dressed up as. And here is Ted Govera's poem, Old Friends. Here we go, Old Friends. So if an old friend I know stops to say hello, would I still see suspicion in your eyes? That's a quote, a epigram from Elvis himself. Old Friends. If I'm lost, not just in direction, but in time, I train myself to look for exit signs. Lyrics certainly have arrows. I know I can walk out. It's a way to never lose oneself. In a land of hard convenience, Napoleon Bonaparte didn't know all the ease we take for granted in the 21st century. Josephine would be more enchanting with our cover girl edges. If Knapp was caught in a trap, and he wouldn't walk out, couldn't walk out. We would never know an old parchment. Knapp seemed never lost himself in terrain. The dawn of Josephine might have been so vibrant that he couldn't see the snare of dust. That's why I'd be lost in the Georgian days, with such royal lyrics ringing in my ear. But to the best of my knowledge, I know I can walk out. They say Napoleon had no phobia, being under Josephine's chin. There was no unresolved tick there. She was never his pre predestined Waterloo, but I wonder if he'd have wondered where she'd been in long absences 
That tucked hand in his chest seemed suspicious, and Josephine, I'm sure, found it awkward. There was no threat. The pungency, pugnant, pugnacity burns red in the field, in rosier still in bed. A battle plan can only be complicated in one. That's why I'd be lost in Napoleon's days with pop lyrics guiding my thoughts. But to the best of my smarts, I know I can walk out. Very cool. That was Ted Bernal Govera. Uh, another wonderful poem uh, that was on Napo- or Old Friends. So thanks for sharing that, Ted. Always a pleasure. Um, let's, uh, let, here we do, let's do uh, Nivedita's poem next. And we'll let Nivy, of course, read it herself. Let's pull up Nivy. Hello, everybody. Oh, hang on one second. Nivy says hello. Um, here we go. Here is Nivy. And here she is reading uh, A Stranger in a Strange Land. Um, this is my attempt at the prompt poem for Rattlecast. A stranger in a strange land. Sometimes stuck amid tiny hills, tiny yet insurmountable, and sometimes deep in a crevasse, one of many deep meandering ones, I stand unknowing where to turn, when to turn, or even why to turn. After all, one tract looks so much like another, and all around this is a turbulent liquid, supposedly to protect, but seems more intent on drowning, drowning me whole, drowning my memories. I'm now a stranger, a stranger in the strange land of my brain. Thank you. Yeah, excellent poem as always from Nivy. That's a stranger in a strange land. You can find more of Nivy, of course, at Nivy's World, N-I-V-Y-S-W-O-R-L-D dot com. Um, thanks, Nivy. Hopefully, maybe with the time change coming up, maybe we can catch you in the morning again. I think, um, you know, it's just the time difference there. Again, Nivy being in India. Um, let's go. Uh, let's see. We have a quick poem by Gail White. I think there's two more poems to read. So I'll read two more poems and then we'll do the um, then we'll do the uh, the prompt in the in the Saiku and then that'll wrap up the show. But here is a uh, here's Gail White's poem, um, a Tourist in India. Uh, Tourist in India. Monkeys are urban animals in Delhi. Peacocks are city birds. And everywhere I'm drowned in waves of men who want to sell me overpriced souvenirs. I fight for air and reach the marble shores of my hotel. Thank God for Lutiens. Where would Delhi be without the British? They used to power well. Spread English, train the boys to ser- that serve my tea. Oh, seductive East. Today I found a Hindu temple, entered and was crowned with marigolds, made puja, walked around in lingam thrice and sang Jai Hanaman, while monkeys chattered, and without a sound, my Christian ghost indulgently looked on. Very interesting. So that was uh, A Tourist in India by Gail White. And um, the other one... This is Annie Wilcox who wanted us to share this poem. This is Obit for a Ford. This was last week's prompt, I believe. Um, obit for a Ford. Um, and it was the, to write an obituary for an inanimate object, if you remember. So let's do this one, too. This is um, Obit for a Ford. Blood red, mom's old car, color safe, highly esteemed, self-driving, self-everything, Ford. You are gone, sold for more than you were worth. No tears now, spoken with, in- with sincerity. You were so shiny, High-fashion veneer, hands-free occasionally, and remote, so remote. As a result, my 65-year-old bleach-blonde, sunglass-wearing female on bright days only self-drives. A two-tone black and blue dated so many men with sleek new tires, convertible VW bug. Don't shed a tear, not one. Live a free, breathe, defective, embrace it. New tattoo-wearing, perfect, and so daring, life. Very interesting. That was a bit for a Ford. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, Annie Wilcox, thanks so much. Um, there's some more, but, but we got to kind of move on. So um, let's see. Actually, let's read. Um, well, now let's let's not. We got to move on. So that is going to be the show for today. Let's move over to um, our, our Saiku really quickly. And our Saiku is right here. It's based on this story that I came across. Um. Let me pull it up on the screen. 
This is every black hole. Now we can see it. every black hole contains another universe. Equations predict. And this is a new paper in physics that came out pretty recently. Um, and the theory which people have posited before is that, um, you know, a black hole is really a wormhole. And on the other side of a black hole is a white hole. Um, and so the universe is kind of nest like cosmic Russian dolls. Um, and there's a white hole on the other side. And what this paper did is, um, is come up with some math that showed that it was actually possible mathematically for this to be the case. Um, you know, so one of those interesting theories and, uh, you know, just one of those things that stretches your mind out a little bit and makes you think in a different way. So I enjoyed this story and my psyche was right here. It made me think, just think of things being nested and, um, I don't know, for some reason it, it, a fly's eye kept coming up in my brain. So here this is my psyche for this week. Many worlds married in the fly's eye, one lie. Many worlds married in the fly's eye, one lie. That is your psyche for this week, and um, that is going to be the show for this week. Next week's prompt is right here. It's a longer prompt to describe. This was uh, chosen by Katie Porter way back in June. I don't even know if she remembers she, she sent me this, but she did. This is uh, the prompt for next week. Use a fragment of a conversation um, as the launch pad. It can be one that you engage in personally or one that you overheard in real life or on a screen. If it helps, keep notes of interesting snippets that you can sit down with later. Start with the snippet on the page and see where it takes you. Sometimes, like with my Rite Aid poem, it will take you somewhere real. Nostalgia or finishing an argument or a tangent. Other times, it can take you somewhere surreal, like with Richard Garcia's. Richard said there were several authorized to be Richard Garcia in this quadrant, and I took that idea and ran with it. So that is your prompt this week. Um, pay attention to an overheard conversation. Um, you know, take notes, write some snippets down, and then write a poem inspired by one of those snippets that you overheard in a conversation. That is going to be your uh, your prompt for next week. And that's the show for this week. So, so glad you could join me. Next week's guest is going to be um, Gary Fine and Elizabeth S. Wolf as part of Prisoner Express. So uh, Prisoner Express is that wonderful organization that, that um, sends poetry, um, reading materials into prisons, and has this kind of newsletter that's like a literary magazine for, for people that are incarcerated to share their work and have some kind of voice and some kind of chance at healing. Just a wonderful project that Gary Fine put together. It was Elizabeth S. Wolf who started out by sending her chapbook, Did You Know? Um, she took her 500 contributor copies and sent them into that program. And then she got a whole bunch of chapbooks in response, which came became the theme in this summer's issue. So we're going to talk to them both and share more poems from prisoners next week um, with Gary Fine and Elizabeth S. Wolf. That's uh, Rattlecast number 156, Monday, August 22nd, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, the regular time. Hope to see you there. Hope you have a great week in the meantime. I'll see you for uh, the critique of the week if you're around for that uh, in the meantime. But I will talk to you later. Hope you have a good one. Good night.